Hello, everybody, as we uh, traverse the tipping point of the day. My name is Michael O'Reilly. Uh, we've just uh, started our Zoom discussion around the future of virtual reality learning versus the future of e-learning. It's certainly a topic dear to my heart, and I think dear to many who are attending today. And uh, we're going to sort of have a bit of discussion, a bit of a debate about that. We did have some difficulty, as you can see, finding a crowd of people who would support that e-learning has a future. In fact, they've turned into skeletons uh, throughout the debate. So we're going to be exploring probably a little bit one-sided today, uh, the future of vir virtual reality learning versus the future of e-learning. It will be a little bit tongue-in-cheek, a little bit of fun with it. So bear with us. And we will be looking to you all for a bit of interaction through some questions and so forth throughout. We do have an ongoing poll. Throughout the, uh, today's session, we invite you to participate in that. A little bit of housekeeping before we get cracking. A uh, little bit of uh, background on our special guest today, Ross Brown. Professor Ross Brown has joined us today, who uh, hails from QUT, Queensland University of Technology, and is a science and engineering faculty, School of Computer Science member there. Uh, his specialty or discipline is artificial intelligence and image processing, other information in computer sciences, and is a PhD from QUT. And uh, Ross, if you don't mind me calling you that instead of doctor, uh, just for get dispensed with the formalities, uh, is co-director at the Cleaver Research Group at QUT. Is that correct, Ross? QUT, that is? Cleaver? Clever? Clever. Clever. Very good. <laughs> and his main research interests are immersive technologies, of course, including VR, AR, and mixed reality. Uh, his main focus, which I love in particular, is how AR and VR environments enhance human cognition, which is really what it's all about in many respects when you're talking about learning. Um, and specialties in training, business process, elicitation, and disability training, and amongst other things. Academic lead for the Visor Lab at QUT and course coordinator of the Bachelor of Games and Interactive Environments at QUT also. So welcome, Dr. Ross Brown. How are you going, Michael? <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to uh, formalities get through? Yep. Um, we're going to be recording this. So if anyone has any questions and so, oh, sorry, if anyone would like to access it at the end, they can certainly do so and make the link available. And as I said, we have a poll going. And we will be having a bit of a Q&A at the very end of the session. Uh, so put your uh, questions in the messaging section and we'll get to those at the very end where Ross and I can answer them as, uh, as they come through. So welcome and thank you very much, Dr. Ross Brown. Appreciate you being part of today's session. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, always happy to come and talk about immersive technology and its effects on people and society and everything else. I mean, there's a lot to talk about. Yeah, always up for it. Thank you. Thank you so much, mate. Really appreciate it. And um, I want to get straight to some numbers, if you don't mind, Ross. And I'm going to just read them out to everyone for them to, to hear. And these are real numbers. These are from a PwC report, which I often quote. Uh, there are many good reports out there at the moment in terms of VR versus e-learning and so forth. But I'm going to read you some really important headline data that comes out of a PwC report, which we have shared with everyone. If they'd like to get a hold of that, it's ready available. Four times faster to train people in VR than e-learning. That's pretty impressive. 275% more confident to apply skills using VR as opposed to e-learning. That's massive also. 3.7 times more emotionally connected to the learning if you are trained through VR compared to e-learning and four times more focused than the e-learning peers. Now that's not just a little bit better, that's four times better. What do you think of that data, Dr. Ross Brown? Uh, that correlates quite well with all the, the research I've been reading. There was a recent summary that did a meta study of around 53 other papers and found that they all, they had, all of them had uh, cognitive effects. Yeah. And uh, only what, but some of them were negative, which is interesting. So there's always the gotchas. And I think I mentioned to you before, there's always, it always depends. Uh, it's never yes or no. But uh, I think, you know, I think the research is showing, yes, there are some really good effects on, uh, you know, memory retention, uh, skills acquisition and so forth. And it just correlates with the research that comes pouring in my inbox every morning from Google Scholar all showing all sorts of interesting results. Yeah. But, um, and even some of the stuff I, even the, the my, I'll frankly say the minor stuff I get up to, uh, yeah, it correlates well. Uh, th th these are really good things for training. Yes, I would That's, agree. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting you talk about that because obviously your focus, 
across is, you know, in the workplace and in training settings, it's one of your focuses anyway. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. always come back to what's the purpose of all this learning that we're putting forward to our employees in the workplace, right? Like whether it be a safety type course or a induction type program, what, what is the actual purpose of this learning? What is the purpose of this training? And, you know, when you're looking at it from that perspective, you must be pretty buoyed with the future of VR. Yes, yeah. I mean, I, I see it from a number of a number of perspectives. So I think the pure re, the pure and applied research in this area is really showing lots of promise. That's why everybody gets excited. Mm -hmm. uh, there's massive investment, uh, obviously from Silicon Valley and elsewhere in this space. So that's cool. So that means you know uh, research. There's a good potential for research in this space, mm -hmm. um, and also the employment prospects are quite good as well. Just from, from my perspective as a VR technologist and VR software developer and, you know, uh, and a gainful experience uh, developer, uh, yeah, I'm constantly being hassled by companies, including yours, looking for good graduates. So <laughs> it's, uh, and that's nice to see, because uh, I went through the collapse of the games industry in Australia and, you know, watched it sort of mm, fall down. It's recovered a bit, but the potential in the immersive space, mm. I think is uh, will far outstrip that, and I think it's a like it's a sustainable. I see it as a sustainable business plan moving forward because it meets basic human needs of education and training yeah. uh, for treatment, such as PTSD and so forth. All those sort of things that seem to be benefiting from this immersive technology. Uh, and so, yeah, I think it's. It, look, I'm very excited to be part of this industry. And uh, I think it has a good future. And over uh, notwithstanding. I, I want to bring us back to the purpose of learning, if you don't mind, Ross. And particularly yeah, for it. as it applies to cognition, cognitive, cognitive effects of immersion and so forth on humans. Because yeah. I keep coming, I, I keep bringing L&D people, HR managers, safety managers, CEOs, CTOs, et cetera, back to this fact, right? The purpose of learning in the workplace, you know, it might be for a safety outcome or to make people more less biased when it comes to race and, and gender and these sorts of things uh, to be more empathetic for people with PTSD. And if the purpose is to make people more empathetic or have greater knowledge acquisition and retention, these sorts of things, then traditional ways are just not cutting it, right? And VR does improve in that way. And it's because of the cognitive aspects. So you're a real expert in this space. Can you share <laughs> the cognitive effect of immersion on humans as it comes to learning, which, which goes to the central purpose of learning yeah. and training? Okay, no so, so you know, from our perspective, it seems that the results are showing uh, that you're more likely to remember items that you're presented in the environment. And interestingly enough, from some of the research I've done, you're also more likely in an environment to recall knowledge you've previously uh, laid down, which is one of the focuses of, of, my, of the research I've done with some of my students. Mm -hmm. um, in addition, I mean, it, it sort of comes, I mean, the effects come from, uh, you know, positive ideas of situated cognition by research called, I hope I'm pronouncing their name correctly, De Guide and Brown, 1989. And uh, the idea is that, uh, you know, knowledge is laid down uh, via context, that a lot of the information that is sort of inserted into your brain while you're learning uh, needs a supporting context to be recalled. And so therefore, if you're, you know, it works, I think it works both ways, which is interesting. And I think that's the research backs that up that, yeah, if you're in the environment learning the things, you're more likely to retain it. So you're not just sitting there looking at a, sorry, a slide or, you know, a PowerPoint presentation. You're in the office. It might even be a model of your office. So you lay down the information with the context, the bodily orientations, the, the, the gaze, everything is fed into your brain and gives you that context so that when you you sit in your office and go, what was I supposed to do for that business process? Oh, yeah, I go here and I do this and I fill that form out. So yeah. uh, that's what we've seen in our, you know, in our uh, experiments that we're doing at QUT. Um, and we also think that applies, you know, even to environmental expert extraction. Mm -hmm. But, um, but also it seems that uh, humans, so one of the things that I think is interesting about human memory uh, is that it has a strong spatial element. 
So you would have heard of memory palaces. So hopefully I'm not preempting anything you're about to say, but I'll, I'll wander into this area. Memory palaces. Sorry, go, sorry, Mike, I didn't Keep catch going. that. Keep going. Keep, Keep going, going. right. Um, <laughs> so, so when you watch uh, Benedict Cumberbatch in a uh, Sherlock Holmes uh, TV series recently, I've stopped watching television, so I'm not keeping track of things, but I remember watching it and he, they had the whole, the whole memory palace rolls his eyes in the back of his head and he's wandering around in his memory palace finding things. Mm. That's a thing. There's a lot of, there was a recent yeah. German research that showed that is a thing and it's a great way to remember things. The Greeks were right. They developed this method and now it is, um, it's an appropriate way to remember things. So, and again, this is what we, I've done with some research and other people. I'm not alone in this. This is, this is being established. Uh, you know, plonk the information you need to remember in a scene and you're more likely to remember it because you've moved between locations. Yeah. And it's as simple as that. And humans are very good. I'm not so good in a car park at a Westfield, but okay. humans are usually pretty good at finding their way in an environment. And it's posited because if you don't remember where food or your enemies or, um, uh, you know, a potential partner from a tribe over the hill or whatever, you wouldn't have survived. You know, we're quite good at, at being able to remember trails and just establish directions with quite long lists of things that we have to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it seems that this manifests in digital spaces. Uh, so, so these cognitive effects are interesting. So I'll finish with one example that we did. We just, this was just with desktop virtual reality. We mm -hmm. took a business process and uh, we did an A versus B comparison where we showed like diagrams, boxes with arrows. You know, that's, that's our lives as business process people. Um, and then we took the same process uh, using the same diagrammatic elements and just plonked them onto desks in a fictional office. The office had nothing to do with the process. It's just, I, I was, my PhD student bought the office off the Unity Asset Store and I got a copy of it and just whacked it in this environment. We plonked the process at the desks and there was, we found that in a, like a laboratory test, you had like a 10% increase in memorability just from doing that. Yeah, right. That's incredible. Just, yeah, just moving in the space. So there could have been other factors. Yeah. Um, so, you know, look, that was just a couple of experiments we did, but it sort of confirms this idea that uh, VR opens up the opportunity to provide spatial context for your learning, which seems to fit, fit into how humans like to remember things. There's other forms, sort of the embodied forms of picking things up. And when you pick the thing up, you remember how to use it. Yeah, which you can and do with many VR creations also. Yeah, and I mean, sure, you can do that for reality. So sure, I can learn to do my safety checks with real things. But the mm -hmm. nice thing is it transfers to VR and you're able to, you know, work your way around the office learning your safety induction check and yeah. it will have a similar effect on your memory. That's the what seems to be coming out of the research. So you can yeah. do a digital form, yeah. And you're kind of touching on it, certainly intuitively, uh, then my next part of, of the sort of line of questioning is skills transfer. How does this component apply yeah. into skills transfer? Like the, the yeah. teaching of something that you need to then apply in a workplace setting. Like, is this, is this yielding out better, newer ways of actually getting better outcomes from a skills transfer perspective, or is it still is it failing in that regard? VR. I think. Yeah. Okay. So that that's interesting. So my understanding of the research is that it's it, VR is great for learning sequences of things, great for learning you know to familiarize yourself with environments. So you have the spatial knowledge. So you go, mm -hmm. oh, that's right. When I come to this door, the MRI scan is down the hallway down there, and that's where we do our you know like that's where I will go to do the scans of the patients. You know, you just know your way around the space. Uh, but my understanding is that some skills struggle uh, to be transferred because, of course, there's strong embodied elements of them. So if it's uh, so I would argue that learning guitar in VR probably wouldn't transfer well mm. because you lack uh, a lot of the embodiments. But I think you would get a transfer of the knowledge around the guitar where the notes are and elements of how the guitar might, uh, you know, appear to you, you would know what it is, uh, but you would not be able to play, I would argue, from a VR 
you know, example, because you just don't have the embodied feel. Yes. It's a good, it's a good point, right? And I think it probably yeah. comes back to, you know, some people's reticence as to whether or not VR is ready to take the lead over e-learning and these sorts of other sure, optionalities. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Is yeah. this purely a case of uh, just not quite there yet? Like you gave a, the example of a guitar, right? Sure. And yeah, you're yeah. Like MR, mixed reality as well as AR and VR, right? Is this yeah. purely a case of just not quite ready yet or a case of you don't think it'll actually get there? That's a good question, Michael. I'm glad to ask it. I'm glad to answer yeah. it. Um, <laughs> Done after that. Because that, that's the hard, that's the hard, uh, that's the hard part. It's what, you know, and every, you know, every technology just comes up against a bit of a cliff that it's got a scale. And I think haptics and uh, right. these sort of feedback mechanisms are the next sort of tough problem to solve uh, technology wise. So we are able to show really good visual realism to people. Uh, we're able to map hand movements. Now, you know, we all got our quests and we can see our hands moving, but haptics is probably haptics and uh, eye accommodation. So there's still some visual work to do um, and even sound as well. Mm. Uh, some of these finer aspects are still a challenge, but for education and for what we're talking about here, training, um, so more training, then yeah, I think we'll, this is still a while to go. Um, it will be interesting to see how this unfolds. I saw an interesting video this morning, um, you know, from the, the whole uh, you know, startup scene. I think it's actually a paper by Microsoft. Uh, some of you who are probably following VR would be seeing this. It was a strange device. I might try and find it and share it at the end, but it, it sits on your wrist and it's got like a ball on a pivot. And as you touch things, the pivot thing comes out and touches your hand and you grip the ball. Yeah. And then it applies a force to you. Now, I have no experience of this. I was just watching the video, but it was quite interesting. It was used to simulate picking of, of just an apple from a tree. So as you reached forward <laughs> towards the, the system uh, in the virtual world, the, the thing unfolded and applied a force to your hand. So you could grab the apple and have the haptic feedback of that. So they're working on it, yeah. but I have to admit, I looked at it and thought that's still, it's going to mimic some forces and it's going to be fairly gross in texture and feel mm. uh, compared to what we perceive with our hands. And I mean, our hands are massively encoded in our bodies. Uh, it, 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 I'll keep rabbiting on, Michael, and you can tell me to stop. I love no, talking about this stuff. No, you're leaving. But, uh, if you look up the Latin word homunculus, you may have seen the homunculus is a mapping of the human body uh, uh, by a uh, number of nerves allocated to positions on the body. A lot of you may have seen this. So uh, uh, your hands, if you were to reorganize and rescale your body according to the sensitivity and encoding in the brain and just allocation, your hands are massive because they're very sensitive to things. And we know that and they we use our hands to interrogate the world around us and to obtain knowledge. So the brain is using this to get an idea what the hell's going on around it. And so, but we just don't have the technology to match that mapping. We can match in a lot of ways our visual mapping and we can, we can come close to, you know, there are some things I see in computer graphics or sometimes I've been in VR and I go, I'm starting to lose touch with reality. The virtual reality is dominating me. I'm definitely present. Yeah. But the haptic side of things, there's a long way to go. But that being said, so the exception to that would be if you start to give people items. So you, you do work with safety induction and you've got, you know, I've used some of your apps and we talked about how, uh, you know, the safety harnesses or whatever. There's nothing yeah. to stop you making that an integrated part of a VR experience. That's right. So that you've got this mixed reality or, you know, what we used to call it, augmented reality, so that you hold the thing, but you're taken through a training program at a site, a fictitious site, but you can hold that item in your hands and get the feel for it mm. so that, you know, oh, this one's broken. Yeah, I can. So you give them a broken one and they go, oh, that's the feel of a broken safety belt. Yeah. I always have a lot of, when I'm having a lot of conversations with clients and partners and customers and so forth, they often talk about, oh, you can't, exactly right. You can't do necessarily that full harness inspection and actually donning a harness or something yeah. like that in VR. And I, and I look at them, I think, can you actually do that knee learning? No. 
You know what I mean? So yeah, I guess yeah. then the other flip side of that is, you know, you can do it in a class-based environment and so on yeah, and so yeah. forth. But then there's, that's, you you know, comparing apples with apples in that regard. So I want you to actually, you work with me on this one because yeah. you're a bit of a futurist when it comes to this. And I think that comes with the fact that you're at a university and you're always looking at the latest and greatest technology, sure. yeah. research and so forth. So I want you to put your futurist hat on for a moment. When do you reckon we'll get to that point? I mean, keeping in mind the VR, yeah. it's been around mm. 20 or 30 years, right? Yeah, and yeah, 20 sure. 20 or 30 years ago, it, it was not workable like it is now. Not no, like no. Now it's actually entering mainstream. It's actually falling into the mainstream, into, even mm. into pop culture, you know, ready player one, yes. these types of things, you know. Yep. Virtual reality and augmented reality is being used in the yep. workplace far more. Yep. Homes are having it, particularly thanks to COVID. You know, you know Oculus is sold out during COVID, only now yep. they're available again. So put your futurist hat on, knowing what's needed to get it even further into the mainstream, what do you think is gonna to have to happen? And what do, what do you reckon, how long is it gonna be until VR is actually really mainstream entirely in the workplace setting and does potentially replace the likes of e-learning and so forth? What's gonna to have to happen? Yeah, oh, oh, well, I guess it's some of the things I've touched on, pun yeah. intended, haptics. Yeah. Uh, so that's the one. I think that's the biggest one to probably conquer, especially for workplace training, and and obviously you know so your sector. Um, but I, it, it's less of an issue for me in, in education, in tertiary education, because we usually just usually just transferring knowledge to the students, so we can use VR's capabilities fairly well there. Mm -hmm. um, the, the other thing I think as well uh, that might be useful too is so is the development of good AI and good uh, avatar representations yeah. to bring the human element into the training so that even though it's much more engaging, it is, and all the results are showing it, though the caveat is it's new. So when you're measuring these sort of things in experiments, there was a recent paper put out where they said, VR needs to go through a phase of repeating its experiments. Yeah. So it's a, it's a, it's a, I'm, I'm just, it's, this is just the honest truth. All great. the results are great. Yeah. But, the, but it's novel. So therefore we have to be sure by repeating to make sure we've got replicatable results in time. So, uh, so I think also AI and avatar representations that will, you know, have you, you know, the, the person teaching you, which humans like, you know, that's why mm. I, I think that's a key, you know, MOOCs don't really work well because don't. you don't have a human talking to you you know they, they're just it's, it's just this lecture and this barrel. yeah so um the barrel and i think yeah. one thing i want to understand for yourself is just where vr sits in the immersive workplace of the future yeah um, sure like what are you seeing unfolding in that regard as workplaces hmm. have you seen it accelerate due to COVID? yes um, there's people, so the classic uh, example is that everybody's been launching themselves into active, act, uh, what act, alt space VR, the Microsoft yep. solution. Then there's the, the Mozilla hubs, which yep. is the, uh, the open source solution. And then Spatial, which is an interesting startup with these sort of scanned um, versions of yourself as an avatar in that space. So yeah, I'm seeing a lot of acceleration for that. I'm seeing a lot of requests uh, from people who want to do research into this area. Um, and also, I think that COVID's just given it a flip because we've learned, yes, you can do work mm -hmm. away from work. So we're, we're talking to each other now, we're not in, in person. This is yep. working, Yep. and it's a pun, but it's, uh, but it's not because we've lost all that sense of social presence. Yeah. You know, it's, it's very tenuous. Mm -hmm. I can't see the crowd. I can't, I can't see somebody, you know, laugh at a joke I make. I can't engage in eye contact with a crowd, which I'm used to. Mm. Um, so I think uh, it's shown us that it can work, but it's also shown us that VR is not quite there yet because of some of the technological requirements in this sort of work setting. Not, the, the, not necessarily the training settings, yep. but the um, just work settings will require much better sort of representations of humans mm -hmm. that can be viewed and so we can capture the facial expressions the body expressions really well so i can communicate with you nice and easy in a virtual environment and those sorts of things which you say aren't quite there yet from a vr perspective do you view them as fatal 
Um, the, oh, the, the facial expression one. No, I sorry, think that's, fatal, that they'll kill the future of VR. Fatal intent. Oh, oh, no, no, no. That, that was what I was. Yeah, no, no. I, I regard the facial expression ones as fatal. <laughs> I think if uh, so, they for you, for, oh no, no. Uh, all right. Uh, yeah, let me keep going. It's um the facial expression thing is needed because we're using it here via video. It's how yeah. we can, you know, we how we can yeah. that as humans. Yeah. We the, Facebook are quite well on the way to solving that. Yeah. They had a recent uh, video that probably a lot of people in the industry know about where they've trained neural nets to synthesize your representation in 3D with the correct facial expressions based upon your voice and your point of gaze. Mm. And so that means that, yeah, I, I would say that one is within reach. I would, so the futurist in me would say, I give it five years and there'll be a product, probably even sooner, yeah. that will put the headset on and I'll see all your facial expressions, I'll see all your body movements that are quite easily tracked. Yeah. And we'll, we'll, I'll look at the audience. The audience will be in this auditorium and I'll see them and they'll all be tracked and I can see their expression. I it's think that's damn close. That's damn close. Damn close. There's been massive inroads in yeah. VR hardware, VR software, the rapidity of uh, sorry, the, how it's accelerated from a software development perspective, the cost side of things from VR headsets, VR hardware is coming. Yeah, completely. Yeah, yeah. No longer do you need a high-end gaming uh, computer, you know, three or four grand just to have uh, a VR experience, which would be tethered. That's no longer necessary. It's standalone. Yeah, there is yeah. Just, the whole you know, mobile thing. Yep. All that thing, and that's happened in just literally the last two years, Ross, hasn't it? I mean, yeah, yeah, completely. If that's the acceleration rate, then that's quite that's ex that's extremely exciting. Yeah, and I think the um, and I think it's it's interesting because it's also just driven by the needs, you know, the cost savings in training that come from you know convincing simulated environments. It's like you know, your budget suddenly falls. You don't have to provide physical spaces yeah. as much. So you can save yeah. money, give people dangerous training. There's just so many uh, yeah. price savings there. Better training, they remember more. So it's like it's sort of a no-brainer to me that this is occurring, notwithstanding some of the yeah. technical issues we're just going to have to figure out over time. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm interested to explore that with you a little bit further because quantifying the value of, of learning outcomes, right? So from a sure. workplace setting, which are very ROI-based, you know, you send someone to a face-to-face -face training course, maybe for grand, and then you can quantify some flights and accommodation, meals, costs, whatever. Um, you, you, you put them on an e-learning course, cost you $1.50 because that's all it's worth. Or, or you invest and put, you know, put 10 grand into setting up for VR and developing a package or something like that. But then you get better learning outcomes from the VR, right? Like how do you quantify the better learning outcome in that regard? Like that's, that's the part which I think is something which I struggle with quite uh, sometimes in, in putting a, a number on it and then saying, well, that's worth X. Um, there's certainly ways to do it, right? But it's interesting yeah. that that's, that's, that's how workplaces work these days, right? They're all about sure. ROI and you quantify yeah. it empirically. Yeah, it's, it's investor money. It's ethical. It's ethical to give a good return on investment. That, you know, I'm under that constraint as a university academic because this is public money. You know, I've got, I've, you know, people have given me their tax paying, their taxes, do stuff. So I'm under an ethical constraint to make sure that I deliver return on investment. Um, it'd be interesting whether probably the way to look at it would be to, I, I, I'm not an expert in this area. So I'm going to talk off the cuff. Uh, <laughs> hey, that's life. Um, I, I would imagine the deviance, the, either the positive or negative deviance in uh, an, in a, so in business process management, they talk about this, it's for business management. They talk about, you know, looking for a deviant and that's a key indicator of something working well at a site or something working badly. You know, just like you get information from your mistakes. You imagine you should be able to work back on the costs. Mm. So if somebody blows up a nuclear power station because they did not follow procedure, yeah, you should be able to go, okay, that, that cost us $100 million to fix this thing. That's a, an egregious example. Mm. And then you just go, okay, and the cost of a good training package is X thousands of dollars. You start to see a return on investment, I think. Yeah. But it's, but of course. Yeah, there's macro yeah. data, there's big data. And yeah. you put it all in and you can extrapolate and push out an actual number, can't you? 
Well, right. true. And you can do that sort of analytic stuff, but I think it's, but it's also because it's positing into the future, something that has not occurred. So you're right. making, you're making a guess probabilistically about, all right, if, if, if Johnny doesn't do his training properly, yeah. some stuff can occur and you could say, well, with probability across your organization, you're going to get X number of events that are cataclysmic and they cost. Yeah. And that's, that's where I get particularly excited about things such as eye tracking uh, yes. with the application of safety based training, hazard identification, risk awareness type training Yeah, using VR, because you can now illuminate where the student is looking in a VR scene that might be uh, purpose built for hazard identification and risk profiling and, and identify that they're not identifying the hazards in the workplace. And if they do, even yeah. though they might look at them for three minutes cumulatively, and then when they do, they might actually uh, uh, put in a lower risk profile than the business actually sees fit to, to attribute. So from that perspective, it can actually be quite predictive, I feel, I feel. And, you know, lack of hazard awareness is a big problem and does lead to accidents in the workplace, which impacts insurance premiums, people's yeah. lifestyle, so on and so forth. So it's a big deal from that perspective. Ross, we might actually, we've got a lot of questions coming through. So might oh, actually... Yeah might actually uh, pause for a moment, if you don't mind, and actually yeah. go through a few of these questions, if you don't mind, Charlotte. Maybe you can read one out to us there. Yeah. From a cognitive and engagement and psychology perspective, how do we help individuals join the dots between virtual and real life? Yeah, good question. That's <laughs> one for you, Ross. That's an interesting one. Uh, I'm trying to think because it's... Uh, so the... Uh, well, uh, all right. The, the short answer is uh, to get, you need a model of that, do the research to figure out what are the things that stop you from transitioning the skill that you've learned in the virtual to the real life, and then just dig, dig down on it until you've got that capability nailed. And I don't think you have to be hyper real or have hyper expensive environments to do that necessarily. So for instance, you know, in induction processes, um, one could imagine that a lot of it can be done with, you know, even just just 360 video and just, you know, put them around the environment and say, here's the emergency shower over here and left of the lockers. And they, you know, if they can recall that yeah. and that's all that's required, then that's fine. Um, and that's that's enough to get that knowledge into them in real life via the, the virtual space, if I'm reading this uh, correctly. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that's the one that I think VR is doing really well at and then there'll be some point where it, it breaks down and i guess that's where you would have to have a mixed mode so i assume that uh you know various industries are probably going to you know probably have to have the um what shall we say a progressive training process because it might be such a dangerous thing that you're doing that you must train them in situ I see, yeah 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 and that's so right. i think there's a if, again if i'm reading the question correctly you start them with the knowledge just like press this button, do this, do that. Then the next step is, you know, a good high quality simulator. And then it's okay, we're now on site. Here's a really dangerous high voltage device that you're going to use. Mm. And you're going to show me and certify yourself as capable of doing that. So, um, so I think that if I got that correctly, I think it's just a, a progression from the virtual to the real mm. and some sort of uh, changing at each step according to a good cognitive and pedagogical model of you know what works at that stage hopefully that's answered good. your question david yes Charlotte. how do you see vr working with mobile visual micro learning interesting how do so, you see VR working with mobile visual micro learning i'm not oh that's the one in the middle sorry yes i, was, I shot, shot over the other one that's an interesting one too okay. um from that perspective, I, I don't know particularly how it's conventionally done at the moment. Micro learning, certainly, um, or blended learning. I think David's saying there. I think it okay. works really well from a blended learning perspective. Yeah, uh, sure. Like I know that Harness Group, one of our really great clients, they use uh, virtual reality in with their accredited training framework. So they'll have a face-to-face -face learning environment. People coming in to do work at heights training, so on and so forth. And at some point, they'll actually put the guys into the headsets and get them through virtual reality experiences and scenarios and so forth and so they use it in a blended situation and get really great outcomes from that perspective and it kind of accelerates and augments the overall learning ex experience so i think it really does have a place right now in blended learning no doubt about it in my mind micro learning is a little bit hard because you know micro learning by nature is often quite short and sharp yeah um, so 
and you know micro learning uh, probably lends itself more to mobile applications. I would say, at least initially, uh, mm -hmm. you know, like push push notifications and you know quick answers and quick videos and so forth. And because there are so many massive amount, uh, usually uh, augmenting an overall learning experience, uh, at least at the moment, without the ability to, to leverage AI based uh, software development for for workplace training applications. That might not. That might be a little bit of a bridge too far. But into the future, I think as we do evolve how we build learning experiences in VR, we could quite conceivably, you know, putting my futurist hat on, uh, see the ability to extrapolate out through the use of AI technology um, and create uh, micro learning experiences that can be then posted using using VR. But I think that's a little bit uh, off for now. I don't know if you, what your views are on that, Ross. I think AR is probably the other thing that might be if, if you're looking for something. Uh, so mobile AR, it, it'd be interesting to go through the use case, but mm -hmm. just to focus on the micro learning thing you brought out that it's so quick. So yeah. putting on a headset, it'd be just very painful. Yeah. Even if it's a useful pedagogical and cognitive effect, just doing that. But I could imagine potentially uh, mobile AR might be a you know a way to do it because it could be that uh, yep. you set up a spatial anchor at a particular machine and mm -hmm. it's like oh here's the new update to skill you up on the use of this machine you just yeah oh, okay that knob there and that thing there all right and the next step I've got to walk oh there it is and I, so you can imagine an AR rollout using mobile would probably because it's nice and quick you don't put the headset on. And you could, it probably the interface is going to be, even according to Fitz Law, a very similar sort of, oh, okay, these are the things I need to know about this machine yeah. to now use it. Yes. Yeah, I think you're right there. The, the, real, the realities, AR, VR, et cetera. Yep. Yeah, that's really great. Charlotte, next one, please. Based on that example, does e-learning not have the same learning gap? Based on that example, does e-learning not have the same e the same learning gap. I don't quite understand what that means. Oh, the transition between virtual and real life. So I, if I've captured this correctly, um, then yeah. So the so the idea is that e-learning has the same learning gap. So I guess it's affirming, um, you know, what we're saying. Like we, I, I think e-learning would have a larger gap because it's a sudden jump from a two D, like just your classic video representation or something. Mm. To um, to oh we have to do it live now to get you to some level skill level in some sort of blended learning situation, whereas VR at least gives you a simplified transition. I mean you video simulator and then reality. Okay, cool. Oh, and the saying, question was answered. The guitar and all. Of it. Of the okay, curve. got it. Yep. Oh, we're ahead of the curve. Are there any further questions? Oh, I think there's a few more there, but I don't know if we can have time to go through too many more. Maybe one, more. one more we'll do one more of course Is if there's there... any we don't get to we'll try to uh respond sure. yep. definitely. very happy to yep is there a cognitive uh disconnect in a vr environment that someone watching a video made in real life environments does not experience mm. okay I, I the one there that you probably okay uh there's still uh, I've got a trail of thought, but it's the embodiment in VR that um, gives you some of the superior yep. capabilities. More of your, uh, More so you know, your brain is stimulated yep. by, you know, you know, moving your head and it matches and you're immersed and there's a, the presence is increased and therefore one could theorize that that's what's making you much more able to absorb all the information. Um, the disconnect that would be similar would be just this lack of uh, good technology. So I would, I use the definition for immersion as a technological concept, which, and it's from Slater, uh, 2005. I like his, his definition, which is it's the, you know, the level of capability of technology to replace your senses and to effectively dominate you into thinking you're in another place. Yeah. So I would say that the, any, the cognitive disconnects that occur are probably a function of that lack of immersion, either because you don't have haptics or the rendering of the scene is not particularly realistic. Yeah. Something's gone that's that uh, you just you're not given the highest quality uh, sense of being in that space. And so it could be that you lack some cognitive effects due to that, the lack of immersion, the lack of presence, 
doesn't encode well with you and therefore you go to the real thing and you might get a little lost. That would be what I would hypothesize. And I think, and true, uh, you know, VR is not a silver bullet and right. it's not perfect. So there, yeah, and oh. I think this is why there should be good research in that space too, just to find out, oh, we need to use another method here because VR is not quite giving that skill to the person. Yeah, and it's just an evolutionary thing too, right? It's not yeah, sure. gonna, like you said, it's not gonna be the panacea, it's not gonna be the silver bullet, which all of a sudden, it's gonna be an evolutionary thing. Yeah, yeah, sure, yep, completely agree. So I think, yes, there are those gaps, and I think it's related to technical levels of immersion yep. in that space that you're using, yes. Okay. All right, Ross, well, I think we've covered a fair bit here, a lot of good stuff. I wanna really turn to Charlotte now and see what the poll says. Let's see what the tribe, if the tribe has spoken, I know it was, it was, it was a particularly one-sided discussion, so it'll be interesting to see what was said. But uh, I think we've been running a bit of a poll and uh, we'll see what um, the people say here. What's the, um, what's the verdict? From our side on the Zoom, we've got 67% um, believe that virtual reality will live longer than e-learning at 33%. Yeah, so that's one. So 67% believe VR will outlive e-learning. Very good, I like that one. What's the next one? Because we're, we're running two, one on LinkedIn also. I'm just asking what that is Last time I looked, it was a similar type of, uh, mm. I guess, you know, two, two data sources must be true. <laughs> okay, so e-learning is at 36%. 36% support e-learning. And virtual reality is 64%. 64%, very interesting. Good. <laughs> very good. Well, look, I, I want to say a massive thank you, Ross, for your participation and, and no problem. I think you really added a massively awesome uh, scientific layer uh, and research layer to that discussion and debate around the future of VR versus VR learning versus the future of e-learning. Um, to all the audience who participated and contributed, thank you very much. Appreciate your questions. Uh, we'll yeah. be sure to, for those who we didn't get to, uh, yeah. get back to you afterwards. But um, any final words, Ross, before we wrap up, mate? Um, oh, look, it, I think, done, you know, we, we were, I'm a bit, uh, it, all I can say is, look, it, it, I think it's quite uh, clear that this is a really impressive technology. I've been in the graphics and uh, game space for 30 years now. I think this, I don't like the word, but it does apply, disruptive. It yeah. will do a lot of things. And I'm expecting in my industry of education, uh, tertiary education, for this to be very disruptive yeah. once they get certain technological issues through. So, yeah. you know, I encourage people to get on for the ride because I think it'll be very interesting. And if, I don't usually say that because I've had 30 years of silly statements by business execs saying, oh, this is going to change things and nothing happens. But yeah. I think this one will change things a lot. Yeah. Uh, for, for your sector, the university sector, I mean, could could we see a time when we don't even have the brick and mortar of university? Oh, that's an interesting question. And I, I agree. I think uh, for certain courses, for yeah. certain courses, uh, such as the one I teach, which is entirely digital. Yeah. I've just taken students through, because of COVID, I've put them through their capstone game development experience online and yeah. it's worked. Yeah. And the only thing absent is that I can't, I can't see them in the flesh and there's no social cohesion that comes with that. Mm. Once you add VR to that mix, I don't have to go to QUT to deliver that unit at all. I'll just share a final anecdote on that very point. Yeah. Like when COVID kicked off, uh, a good friend of mine was overseas and we were talking, he came back and he had to sort of stay in quarantine and we were talking over Zoom and all the rest of it. And then, a, a month or two later when the sort of quarantine ended, we caught up and it was only after a, a fair bit of time, we realized we actually hadn't seen each other face to face for like yeah. three or four months. So I think that we kind of get a lot of that face to face requirement through Zoom and through the digital media side of things. So I think we sometimes can maybe perhaps overstate uh, some of those things from an area of performance. So long as we're seeing people face to face like this, it seems to be enough in many cases, I feel. Yeah, yeah. Uh I think there's there's something, yeah, and it's an interesting one. You you could have an I think you could have a debate about that just just on the in the on the topic itself. You know, the, the use of video yeah. versus the use of immersive systems and seeing a person. Yeah. You know, and it would be not me talking to the camera, but it would be me going, Michael, 
You know, I'd just yeah. be looking at you and you're there and there's yeah. an audience and that we're keyed into that. So that'd be a nice debate to have. I'm up for That's that. <laughs> All right, mate. Look, thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate it. And thanks to all the attendees for giving up yes. a bit of your lunch break, having your sandwich while watching us. Uh, much yep. appreciated. And uh, look out for the next one coming up in a couple more weeks and another edition of uh, the webinar. I think the next one's about industrial manslaughter, which is going to be interesting. Industrial manslaughter and how uh, obviously 60% of workplace fatalities, they they believe are at least somewhat contributed to by by per, poor learning or competency or lack of training mm -hmm. poor training. So that's a big one for us. Industrial manslaughter is a big issue in the workplace these days. And, you know, CEOs are at their wits end with concern right now around going to jail and big fines and so forth. So we'll be discussing that in our next session. Um, thanks again, Dr. Ross Brown. Appreciate your time. Thanks very much. Thank, Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you to the audience for their questions. Appreciate it. All good. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.